Amen. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 21. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 21. This month, we've been going through a series entitled Building Together. Building Together. And, and we've been blessed, and God's been challenging us, and uh, I believe He's been bringing some revelation. And I pray tonight that He does that, and God continues to move and speaks to our heart tonight. So we're going to read out of Nehemiah chapter 4. Verse 21. And just a little background, uh, if you don't know the story of Nehemiah, uh, God put a vision on Nehemiah's heart to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He got news that these walls were torn down, that they were damaged, and it broke his heart, and he had a vision to restore the walls of Jerusalem. So all throughout the book of Nehemiah, we get an account of what took place and how that vision was, was fulfilled. And here we see in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 21, through 23. Uh, let's read that together and I'll share with you here in a moment the title of my message. The Bible says this, it says, we worked early and late from sunrise to sunset and half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. That way they and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day, there were many naysayers. There was opposition that was trying to come against Nehemiah and the people of God that were rebuilding the walls. In verse 23, during this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me, ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. Praise God. Let's bow our heads as we pray this evening. Father, we're so grateful, God, to be here in your presence, Lord. Father, I pray uh, for each one that's in this place tonight, God, that you would, Lord, let every ear be open, God, let our hearts be softened, that we would receive your word with truth, Father God, that you would bring encouragement tonight, Holy Spirit, that you would bring revelation, speak to our hearts, guide us and direct us, Father God, and lead us in the way everlasting. We thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory. We ask in Jesus' name. We all say, amen. Praise God. Tonight, I want to speak on the power of momentum. The power of momentum. Now, my goal tonight is to encourage you, to encourage you to, to finish this race that God has called you into. It's my goal tonight to, to remind you that, that God is with you and that what God has started, he desires to finish in your life. That you're not here by accident. That you didn't get saved by accident. None of it was by accident. We're going to learn here in just a moment that, that when the Lord called you, it was His doing. He started it. Okay, so, so you and I are called, and we're called to build the kingdom of God, and we're called to keep the momentum so that the kingdom of God will be built. Now, what is momentum? Momentum is considered to be the quantity of motion, the quantity of motion. As God's people, we have a large task in front of us to preach the gospel, to win this world for Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? That's the great commission, that the church of God would be built, that many more would, would come into the sheepfold, would come into the house of God and, and know Christ just as you and I have known him. Now I look around and it's, it's a blessing to see your beautiful faces. But you know what I also see? I see some chairs that can be filled with some more souls. Some lives that need to be changed. I know that, that God is not done with us and we have our issues and God wants to continue changing our lives, but there are many out there that still need to hear the good news and God has called you and I, church, to take up the mantle and to accomplish what he's called us to accomplish. Now the first thing that we have to understand if we're going to keep momentum is the fact is that God has called you to this race. God has called you to this course tonight. It's God's doing. It's God who has called you. I think back in my life how things transpired, how I got saved. Now, when, when, I was, when the gospel was shared with me, I had to make a decision, yes, to, to open up my heart and accept the good news. I had to make that decision. But the Lord called me. God's an orchestrator. Man, I look back and I look, I look at all the situations that transpired that caused me to step for, foot into a church. And even before that, that caused me to start to look up and to think about, about the existence of God. And I was 14 years old. I was a young man searching and, and living my life according to what I thought was fun and what I thought was important. But God had a bigger plan. And I remember God, as a, as a young boy, God planting seeds in my life through my grandma. 
telling me, I have to go to church. I need Jesus in my life. Without Jesus, we're nothing, she would tell me. Nine years old, ten years old, she was, she was planting these seeds. And we know what the Bible says, right? That, that one person plants, another man waters, but God brings the increase. And then as time transpires, I see my dad get saved, and I see the change that takes place in his life. I see a real-life testimony in front of me, and I'm, I'm just a young boy. I'm about 11, 12 years old. But I notice, even at that age, that there is something different about this man. And what was it? It was that Jesus Christ changed his life. See, God began planting the seeds early on. And if you think about your story and your life and how you stepped here into the house of God, it may have happened with a thought. There was a need. There was a tragedy, perhaps, that took place in your life that got your attention, and the Holy Spirit began to draw you. See, God draw, draw, drew you in. God called you. You're not here by accident. God called you. Why? Because he has a purpose and a plan for your life. And I'll tell you, church, man, the devil is hard at work right now in this world to convince people that their life doesn't matter. To convince people that there's no change or there's no hope that, that, that can come, that, that they're washed up, that, that they've tried everything and there's no more hope for them. But you know what the Bible tells me? That there's hope among the living. There's hope for you and I. As long as there is breath in your lungs tonight, there is hope. God has called you and has set you on this course. Philippians 1.6, we see here God's commitment regarding the calling that we have. See, God called us. He didn't call us and just leave us high and dry, but he has a commitment. And the Bible says here, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Is that good news tonight? What does that tell us? Is that you're a work in progress. Man, you may have had a hard day today. You may have struggled. You may have gotten frustrated you may think that, man, I, I should be so much further along. But the Bible says that God is faithful to finish the work. He's faithful. He'll finish the work. So that's God's commitment to you and I, that he's faithful to finish the work. Now with this race and with this, this Christian walk that we're in, you and I have a commitment as well. We need to follow through. We need to stay committed to the work of God. We need to keep momentum and allow God's work to be done in our lives. Now let me share some things in my life personally that, have kept, that has kept me throughout the years. Right, because I know we, and, and we pray for those that have, have gone their own way and have, have, have forsaken the Lord and what God's doing. For whatever reason, we pray for them. And we've seen it. I know if you've been around for, for a number of years, you've seen people come and go. And for whatever reason, they've decided that they don't want to follow through. They don't want to stay committed to what God's called them to. But here you and I are tonight. We're here in the house of God midweek. Midweek service. There are other places that we could be. I know you may be tired. You may have had a long day at work. But there's something tonight that drew you here to the house of God. And it's your commitment. Now, what are some things in my life that have, have kept me throughout, that has kept me throughout the years? Well, first of all, that's been God's keeping power, so all glory to him. Amen? It's God that's been, that's been keeping me. It's God's help. And secondly, it's, it's staying close to the, the leaders that God's placed over me, the accountability, the relationships with my pastors, with my leaders, with my fellow brothers and sisters. That has kept me throughout the years. Getting a random text saying, hey, how are you, Matt? A phone call. And passing in the hallway a question, how are you doing today? How's everything going today? Staying close to the people of God. And tonight, if you're in this place and you feel yourself drifting and you find yourself drawing away from the relationships that God's placed around you, I tell you, you need to be careful. It's a strategy of the enemy for, for him to separate us. One, to separate us from Almighty God, of course, but to separate us from the very relationships, the, 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 the Christian fellowship that, that we have. You know, and I know you've seen it. If you look at National Geographic or you look at these, these, um, these documentaries about lions and how they hunt, you know, they're, they're looking for the prey that, that is weak, the one that gets separated 
They're not looking to charge right there in the middle of this herd, but they're looking for the one that gets separated and that's alone and that can't fend for themselves. That's what the enemy tries to do. So if you, you and I find ourselves drifting, we have to be careful. Staying close has kept me. Being faithful in church attendance. So simple, right? Such, such a simple thing to say, but being faithful to church attendance. It's kept me. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Being faithful to church. It's something so simple to understand, right? But we know how we're tempted. We're tempted with, with recreation. We're tempted with you know, uh, other priorities, other ambitions. We're tempted with overtime. We're tempted with all these things that, that on occasion, if it happens, okay, but, but something that become, becomes a pattern and starts to draw us away from being in the house of God, we have to be careful, church. Keeping a priority in my life of being here at church has kept me throughout the years. It's kept me. Reading God's word has kept me. Staying in his word. See, these are some things if we practice, if we keep our eyes on, we're going to be able to keep the momentum and we're going to be able to stay on the course. We're going to have to persevere. Perseverance is something that you and I are going to have to embrace. Now, what's the de definition of persevere? It's a continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failures, or opposition. That's perseverance. Despite difficulties, failures, in opposition. Things are going to get difficult, church. Sometimes we're going to fail. We're going to feel like throwing in the towel because, because we failed, but God hasn't called us to quit. God knew and he understands that sometimes we may trip up and we don't, we don't plan on it. We, we plan against that, but even if we do, God has there's no excuse to throw in the towel. It's not an excuse. You don't get out that easy. God's grace is there. Continued effort despite difficulty, failure, or opposition. Secondly, we can't be swayed. We're talking about momentum tonight. We cannot be swayed. Now, we understand that there are many opinions out there. There are many voices in the world, as, a, as the Bible says, and we have to be careful of what is influencing us and who is speaking into our lives and what is speaking into our lives. Now, listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 33. The Bible says, don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. Now, if we're talking about being swayed and being influenced this way or that way, we have to be careful of who is influencing us. Surround yourself with people that are going to encourage you to be better, who are going to encourage you to be honest who are going to encourage you to be upright, who are going to encourage you to do the right thing, not to do the wrong thing, not to lie, cheat, or steal. Don't surround yourself with those people, but surround yourself with people who are going to help propel you towards the kingdom of God. We can't be swayed, church. If we want to keep the momentum, we're going to have to watch what we're listening to. Who are you listening to? Who have we opened up our ears to? Invited to sit down. Yes, tell me more. I want to hear it. We have to be careful, church. This is an age of instantaneous information, isn't it? Man, someone wakes up tomorrow with a certain opinion. They throw it on social media, and it's out there. They wake up the next day. Their opinion may have changed. They throw it on social media, and it's out there. And who's reading this? Who's being influenced? Many of us are because we're reading that and we're letting that influence our life. And if I could just speak on the, the effect of social media for a moment, this is such a, a, a big topic to talk about. But I would venture to say that some in this place are being affected negatively by social media, by what you're reading, by what you're allowing to fill your mind and your heart and your spirit, by what you're watching on social media, by what you're reading. Now there's a place for it. We have an opportunity 
to rejoice with, with those that are doing well, we have an opportunity, right? There's, there's something nice about that. There's something nice about sharing the good things we're experiencing, experiencing. But listen to this. An article from Grace University said this regarding social media. We have an opportunity to rejoice in the good happening among our friends and peers. But, here's the but, all right? If we stack their glossy world on social media versus reality as we know it, discouragement can follow. In fact, one study found 6.7% of Americans over the age of 18 suffer from depression. And we know how it happens, right? We're looking at, you're looking at your feed. Oh, man, they just got a raise. Oh, man. Oh, they're, they're, they're skinnier than, than I am. Oh, man, look, at they're at the gym. I should be at the gym. Their teeth are whiter than mine. Look at their hair. Oh, man, look at, look at the new clothes that they have. Or look at, they're on vacation here. Or they're on vacation there. And, and rather than rejoicing, what are we doing? We're, we're becoming jealous, right? We're becoming envious. Now, if you could look at that and you could rejoice and be happy for them, praise God, do it. But if you find that it's starting to sour what God's doing in your life and it's causing you to not appreciate the car that he's given you, the house that he's given you, the family that you have, the clothes that you have, the job that you have, the health that you have. If, if it causes us to veer away from that, then we have to check ourselves and we have to possibly put it, put it down for a moment. Perhaps making some rules about how much of that you expose your, yourself to each day. Now, only you know how, how much time you spend on social media. And if you have an iPhone, it'll tell you probably. <laughs> but perhaps we should put some rules on what we're letting in. A little bit less of that, and how about a little bit more of, of, of God's Word? This will change us. This will steer us in the right direction. This will redeem us. This will bring life to us. This will encourage us. This will tell us the truth. Don't go on, on Facebook or Instagram for your truth. If you are, please go to God's word for truth. As we talk about momentum, when you think of the word momentum, you, you can't help but think about a train, right? The energy and the force and the mass of a train, all these cars moving together. And I was thinking about a train, and, and it may think on the, on the surface that there's nothing that can stop a train, right? You get in front of a train, no matter what you have, it's going to plow through. But I was thinking about certain things. What can stop a train? And if we would stick with the analogy of momentum and, and a train, there are certain things that can slow a train down and can eventually derail a train or, or stop a train. And I want to look at a couple tonight. There's one thing called slippery rail. It's low rail adhesion, talking about a train. And listen to this. Even fallen leaves that fall on the track, moist fallen leaves, can detour, deter a train. And if a train experiences the, the right amount of leaves and moisture and is going to peel, it can lose traction. Now you think of, of, of a train being so massive and so, so, so much mass and weight all traveling at, at, uh, together, but something as simple as fallen leaves on a track can affect the train and the momentum of that train. And I think of not keeping, if we stick with the analogy, of not keeping the tracks clean. If there's no maintenance there for the track and, and, and there's, there's not someone keeping those things clean, it's affecting the momentum of that train. Now listen to what the Bible says in Hebrews 12.1. It says, Now therefore, since we, are, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. What are those things that are falling on, on, on the tracks of your life? You have momentum and you're traveling and you're pushing and, and, and God's doing something great, but what, what is the enemy peppering on those tracks that is causing you to slow down? The Bible talks about it. 
the sin that so easily besets us, the weights that we take on. What have you taken on that God doesn't want you to take on? What are you carrying that God doesn't want you to carry? Because if we're not careful, it's affecting our momentum. See, the Holy Spirit is pushing us, is driving us, is energizing us, is giving us strength. But if we constantly feel that we're battle-weary and we're tired and we're discouraged, we have to look at our lives and say, what kind of weights have we let in? The Bible says, strip off every weight that slows us down. Perhaps it's jealousy. Perhaps it's mammon, the love of money. Perhaps it's covetousness. Perhaps it's envy. Perhaps it's bitterness. The Bible says, strip these things off. Because they're slowing us down. Another thing that can affect a train is weather. Winter can provide problems of low adhesion when snow and ice are deposited on running lines, as well as rain in the summer. Now, when I think about weather in the Christian life, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 26 and 27, but anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand, and when the rains and floods come, the weather, right, and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Obedience to God's word. Every time we read God's word, God's giving us instruction. Every, here, every time we're here in the house of God and we're hearing his word, he's giving us instruction. And if you and I refuse to heed his word, we're going to be like someone that built our house on the sand. And the weather's going to come to all of us. Evil and good. To every person, the weather's going to come, but the truth of your foundation will be manifested by the storm. Because when things are going right, everyone looks intact. Everyone has it together. But the weather and the storm will manifest your your foundation. Heed God's word. Take heed to his word. And the last thing as we look at momentum is a lack of line side maintenance. As maintenance is allowed to lapse, talking about trains and train tracks, it results in extra growth of vegetation, increasing the supply of leaves, thereby exasperating the, po- the problem. Overgrowth of vegetation, there's no maintenance there. An overgrowth of vegetation that, that hinders the momentum. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.26, and don't, let, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you were still angry. You know what that's talking about? It's talking about keeping a clean heart. I was thinking about this scripture. Don't let the sun go down while you were still angry. Your Bible may say upon your wrath. Don't let it set upon your wrath. And what does that mean? Well, it ministers to me because someone that is constantly checking their heart and asking God to help them with these issues, before they go to bed, will ask God, God, I forgive them. Take it away. I don't want to sleep on this. I don't want to wake up with this tomorrow. Because what does it turn into, church? It turns into bitterness. One day passes, and we, we still haven't forgiven. Another day passes, and we still haven't forgiven. The sun sets, and, and there, go, there goes a week. And there goes a month. And what happens Bitterness starts to grow, right? Because unforgiveness wasn't dealt with. So what happens? Bitterness begins to sprout in our hearts. See, we have to keep a clean heart if we're going to finish this race, if we're going to keep the momentum, church. Keep a clean heart. If you've been offended, forgive. Forgive. How many times have you and I offended Jesus? How many, how many times have you and I offended our brothers and sisters and they've still forgiven you? They welcome you. They love you. They pray for you. Such an example to you and I. Keep a clean heart, and because of that, we'll be able to keep the momentum. Your momentum and steadfastness will bless others. It will encourage others. You know, seeing you here tonight, my brothers and sisters, your faithfulness, and some of you, I'm, I'm blessed to, to see a little deeper and understand your, your life and, and things that you've opened up with or things that I've learned. And still seeing you here tonight is such an encouragement. 
I know we're not perfect. I know everything hasn't been perfect. I know we've been through struggles. We've been through trials. But the fact that I see your face here tonight is such an encouragement to me. Because I, I, I believe that if you can do it, then I can do it. If you can go on and be faithful, I can go on and be faithful. If you could still lift your hands and worship God, then I can still do it. I have no excuse. Why? Because I see you doing it. You encourage me. You bless me. Your steadfastness encourages me. Now, as we learn in the book of Nehemiah, as the story transpires, as they accomplish the building of the walls of Jerusalem, an insurmountable task, a task that required unity. That's what we're talking about, building together. And as they accomplish this task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, there's a scripture that is so powerful, and, and it's short, but listen to this. In Nehemiah 7.66, and the whole chapter is a blessing, but I just wanted to look at this one scripture here. It says, so a total, listen to this, a total of 42,360 people returned to Judah. 42,360 people returned to Judah. Now, why did they return? They returned because the walls were rebuilt. The city that was once destroyed and was once and was just torn down was rebuilt. And, and what was the result? 42,360 people returned to Judah. Now, let's go back a little bit further. Why were those walls rebuilt? Because there were a people of God that were building in unity. Do you see the result? Do you see that, church, as you and I serve God together in unity, as we partner together and we're serving God and we're encouraging one another and we're doing all that God's called us to do, whatever that means for you and wherever God has you, as we're faithful, do we see what happens here? That many are able to come and to be returned from exile. God's people were in exile in Babylon. They were all over the place, and they were able to return. Why? Because there were people of God that were serving in unity. Now let's go back a little bit further. Why were they able to serve in unity? Because there was a man named Nehemiah who had a burden on his heart to see change come. He didn't sit on it. He didn't think that I'm not up to it. I'm not qualified. He probably had all these thoughts but he was up for the task, and he believed God for it. And because of one man's decision, 40, over 42,000 people were able to return. Do you understand how powerful your decision is to show up to church tonight? It's a testimony that, that your brother who, who, or your sister who's, who maybe didn't interact with you tonight, but the fact that they see you here, they're encouraged. And because you're here, they're encouraged, so they're going to go on for one more day. And they're encouraging someone else. Or perhaps they're taking the gospel there to their home, and, and they're saving people, and they're helping people because they see your encouragement and your steadfastness. Don't take it lightly. When the devil tries to lie to you and I say, just stay home tonight. You're tired. You have laundry to do. You've had a hard day at work. You have this and that to do. Please, please. Be steadfast. Come to church. Show up. Get involved. Be faithful to your ministry. Be faithful to what God's called you to. Because one person's vision and commitment to that vision, uh, to that vision it made a difference for over 42,000 people. That's the impact that we can have on this world. And you may not know. You may not know the impact that you have until you get to heaven one day. But I, I believe and I know, I know that if you're faithful and you continue to do good, what God's called you to do, you are winning the world for Jesus Christ. Everyone is needed tonight. We're talking about building together. Every one of you is needed. Every marriage in this place is so vital to winning the world for Christ. Every single brother and sister that is faithfully serving God is so vital to winning this world for Jesus Christ. Now, when you get a chance, read Nehemiah chapter 3, and we, we were able to see how this was a combined effort and how everyone was working together. But it's because each person was taking on the vision. They were internalizing the vision that, that God had for them. 
And without you being here tonight, it wouldn't be the same. Church wouldn't be the same tonight without you. Our worship service tonight, it wouldn't have been the same without you. Your ministry tonight is not the same without you. You're vital. You're so important. You're so important to the work of God. Please don't let the devil lie to you and tell you that you're insignificant and it doesn't matter. From the youngest person in this auditorium tonight to the oldest, the oldest person in this auditorium, you're so vital and you're so important. One person can make a difference and can change the world. Look at David. Do we remember David? The two armies, the people of God, were on one side of the valley and, and the others were on the other side, the Philistines and Goliath. And, and here comes David, wasn't even planning to get into the battle isn't that how it happens sometimes? We're not even planning that day that, that we wake up. We have no idea what God has in store for us. But it's time for us to step up and to take courage and to, to be that change that we want. Now look at King David. What was he doing? He was bringing lunch to his brothers. But because he had faith and because he understood that he could be the difference in his nation, he led the people of God there, and he was that breaking point so that, so that everyone else can, can gain victory. That was David. What about Moses? Do we remember what he told the Lord? He tried to convince the Lord that he was, he, that God, I'm not your guy. I'm not the one. I'm not eloquent of speech. Who am I to go in front of Pharaoh? Ask Aaron to do it. He's so much more qualified. We think God made a mistake when he called us, like, like maybe he meant the other guy or, or the other person. But God knows your name, and he called you for that purpose, for that task. It wasn't by accident. He called Moses. The power of one person's decision and courage. What about the boy with two fish and five loaves of bread? Because of the small amount that he had as he released it into the, to the mighty hands of Jesus, thousands were able to be fed. And what does that mean for you and I, the, the small talent that he's given us or the, the responsibility or the task or the gifting that he's given us, turning it over to the hands of Jesus will feed a multitude. Can you say amen? It'll minister to a multitude. What about Esther and the change she brought in her society, in her nation? Listen to this. In, in 1854, it was one vote that brought Texas into the Union. In 1876, it was one vote that gave Rutherford, Rutherford Hayes the presidency. One vote, one person is so important. You were so vital. If we're talking about momentum, if we're talking about building together, we have to understand that you and I are an integral part of that. We have such an important part to play. Never feel insignificant. God called you by name. God created you for a purpose. You are important. You're important to this church. You're important to your ministry. Please don't throw in the towel. You may be tired. You may be weary, but hang in there. God is going to refresh you. He's going to encourage you, and he's going to strengthen you. Thank you, Jesus. As our worship team makes their way up tonight, see this small list of individuals, of people that I mentioned. It's just a small fraction in the word of God of people who have said, yes, Lord, you're calling me. Yes, I'll do it. I may not feel qualified. I may not understand how it's going to take place. I may not understand, but God, I will do it. God, I will, I will stay put. God, I will stay put at, at the post that you've given me. I'm not going to veer to the left or to the right. God, I'm going to be faithful with what you've given me. See, understand that through Jesus Christ, you and I are the difference. We're the difference. David, Moses, the young boy with the two fish and the five loaves of bread, Queen Esther. See, they probably didn't see themselves as her heroic people. They didn't see themselves as heroes. They were simple people like you and I, stepping in with courage and being willing to make the difference they said yes no one else is doing it God you're on my side if you are for me then who can be against me God I'll do it I trust in you to help me I trust in you to give me the wisdom and the strength to do what you've called me to do but Lord 
yes, I'll do it. That's all they did. They said, yes, I'll make the difference. I'll say yes. That's all it takes. And what has God been challenging you with? What has he been speaking to your heart about? What is it? Because I know he speaks to our hearts. Perhaps it's just to stay put. You feel like throwing in the towel. You're frustrated. Things aren't changing fast enough. (sighs) Welcome to the club. (laughs) We've all been through it. I've said it before. We have our time frame, and and, and we have our vision and how how we see, all right, when I'm in this age, this is going to happen. When I'm this age, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. But God's timing is perfect, right? His timing is perfect, and he is encouraging you. Just stay put. You may not understand everything that I'm doing right now. This happens with my children. As as my wife and I, as we're teaching them and we're trying to impart wisdom, they're now at the age, they're starting to ask why, why. They're trying to understand. They're trying to fathom why they can't do this or why we're saying this. And Some things we try to explain to them. God, God, give me the wisdom to explain it. But for some things, I have to just tell them, when you get older, you'll understand. You're not going to understand it right now. But it's what mommy and daddy are saying, and it's going to keep you safe. It's going to protect you. And one day down the line, that light bulb may go on. But they're children. They're, they don't have the capacity right now to understand the things that we understand as adults, right? They don't understand why. They can't. We could try to explain it to them, but some things they just can't understand. And that's how it is with God's Word many times. And the Holy Spirit will give us understanding. But there are some things that in faith we have to obey. Okay, Lord, I, I'm, my finances are low, but you're telling me to continue to tithe. So I have this amount of money, and it's slightly positive in my bank account. But, Lord, you're telling me to subtract from that and give it to you. And and naturally speaking, my funds are decreasing. But God's saying, I don't don't work in the realm of of your thinking and and the the capacity of your mind. God's saying, I don't work like that. I work through your obedience. As you obey what I say, and even if, yes, you don't understand it, I'm going to work supernaturally. And although it's decreasing, I'm going to fill it up. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to provide in other ways that you don't see, you don't understand. So some things we'll understand exactly why God's Word says it, but there are those things in faith we have to just receive, and we say, Lord, because you said it, I'm going to do it. I don't understand right now. I don't see how it's going to happen. I don't, I don't see what's going to happen, God. But you're saying this, and Lord, I say yes to you, and I believe in you for the rest. And that's it. That's the simplicity of the gospel. Live by faith. Don't walk by sight. We walk by sight. We're going to be subject to the circumstance and the situation that we'll give, yeah, I'll give when, it, when it's convenient for me to give, or, or I'll do this when it's convenient for me, but God doesn't work like that. Live by faith, not by sight, and in that, we're going to see God move in new ways in our life. Do you receive that tonight? Thank you, Jesus. God is good tonight. Praise God. Let's bow our heads tonight as we pray.